I love it when Ricky and Anton sing together. Hope you guys keep writing songs, right? Awesome. Well, um, when our boys were young, our four sons, uh, like most parents, we developed uh, a series of sort of bedtime routines. You know, there would be bath time and then story time and then prayer time and then finally bedtime and they would hopefully go to sleep. But for a period of time, when our youngest son was about five or six years old, he developed his own little routine that he added to the mix. Uh, We would say, time for bed. He would scramble upstairs and brush his teeth, put his PJs on. And the time it took me to get upstairs to pray with him to put him to bed, he would have grabbed every pillow and every stuffed animal and every toy in his bedroom and stacked them all up on his bed like a mini fortress. I don't know how he did it so fast. And he would be hiding inside that fortress. And the game was, I had to get up there and then sort of sort of break my way through his fortress to, to finally find him and wrestle him into submission. He would fight and scratch and claw to keep me out, and I would fight and scratch to get in, and there would be squealing and wrestling and tickling and maybe a few injuries here and there. But eventually, every night, I would finally break through, and he would surrender, and then we would have bedtime and rest. And I tell a little story because today we are continuing in our series from Psalms called Songs of the Soul, and we're looking at a psalm that's also about a fortress and a battle and rest. Now, we're looking at Psalm 46, and it includes one of the most recognized and well-loved single verses in all the Old Testament. You'll recognize it when we get there. But before we get there, uh, we need to get a little background because it enriches the meaning of the psalm. Uh, One of the questions we ask ourselves when we come to any part of the Bible, or especially these psalms, which are written sort of as prayers of worship, we ask ourselves, what was the occasion, what was the reason that this psalm was originally written? And the psalm we're going to read today, Psalm 46, most scholars believe was written uh, referring to the occasion of the siege of Jerusalem that happened in 701 B.C., when Sennacherib, king of Assyria, was terrorizing the whole world and decided to, to march to Jerusalem and sack the city, so he laid siege to the city. And the king of Judah, or Jerusalem at that time, was a man named Hezekiah, and Hezekiah did a couple of things. First, when he saw Sennacherib coming, and you can look this up, by the way, in the history books. Uh, you, there's, it, it occurs in two places in the Bible. You can find it in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18 and 19 and in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, or look it up in the history books. You could, you could probably find that on Wikipedia. It's a great story. It would make a great movie. But what Hezekiah does is first he, he offers gold. Okay, I'll, I'll give you all the gold in the city if you just don't, don't sack the city, don't capture us. So Sennacherib says, sure. He takes all the gold, then he sat, attacks the city anyway because he was an evil king. Uh, the, second, the, the next two things that Hezekiah does is he uh, has an underground tunnel carved out of rock from a spring that was outside the city walls so that water can run into the city underground, a secret tunnel, so that he could sustain his people with water as long as the siege would last. Really smart king. But the second thing he did was he cried out in prayer to God. And fast forward to the end of the story, the Israelites wake up one day and they look outside the walls and the entire army of the Assyrians is fleeing or dead. Uh, They've been wiped out and they didn't even have to fight. And most scholars believe that something like this happened, that a that a bunch of uh, horde of mice or rats escaped from the city of Jerusalem and infected the entire army with a plague or disease, and they died, and Sennacherib fled and never came back. So it would make a great movie. But here's the psalm written, Psalm 46, in that context. It's a context of battle. It's a context of an enemy laying siege to the city. Now, Psalm 46 has some little instructions uh, for worship. It says, To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. Now, the sons of Korah were just worship leaders in ancient Israel. They wrote songs just like Anton and Ricky did, and they led the people in worship. But the Alamoth uh, word means uh, to be sung at a high pitch, either high-stringed instruments or with soprano voices. Like, imagine Ricky singing this psalm to you. He writes, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though this waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. Now, Selah is an interesting word. It means sort of a musical rest for reflection. This psalm is divided by three Selahs. You'll see them throughout the psalm. We're going to divide the message in the same way. 
Verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. Now that's the verse you're probably familiar with. You've heard it. You've seen it on Christian greeting cards. You might have it on a, in a frame in your kitchen. Uh, and we are tempted to think it means sort of a peaceful time of spiritual reflection. And it kind of does but it means more than that. And the context of the psalm gives us that. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. So this psalm celebrates three things about God. First, God is our refuge. God is our river. And then God is our rest. Let's begin with God is our refuge. When I was in um, second grade, our family lived in Akron, Ohio, and we lived in an old part of the city with blocks and blocks of uh, old row houses all lined up, these two-story houses. This is, in fact, a picture of the actual house I lived in when I was in second grade. I found it on the internet. Uh, It was built in 1918. It's still standing today. Uh, But that was our street, 23rd Street in the Kenmore District of Akron, Ohio. Uh, The little elementary school I went to was just about two or three blocks away. It was called Lawndale Elementary School. The building is also still there, but it's closed now. There's no school happening there. But it was only two or three blocks away. So in those days, I just walked to school. Second grade, just walked to school there and back. Can you imagine that today? My parents just let me walk. So one day, I was uh, leaving school to head home, as I always did. And I'd walked maybe 50 feet away from the entrance to the school. I was still almost right in front of the school. And I hear some um, student behind me yell out, hey, kid. And I, I turned around to see who it was. And it was a bigger kid, like this big fifth grader or so. And he said, wait up. I did not recognize him, didn't know who he was. So I did what he told me to. I just, I waited. And this kid walks up to me. And as he gets to me, he looks at me, and he just slaps me in the face with no warning. I expected a little more sympathy than that, like, oh, <laughs> I'm second grader. He hits me right in the face. I look at him, and he goes, what are you going to do about it? Now, I would like to say that I squinted back at him, and I taught him a lesson he'll never forget, but I didn't. (laughs) I did what any self-respecting second grader would do. I just turned and ran as fast as I could all the way home. Because home was my safe place, my refuge. Psalm says, God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. The word refuge here means a place of shelter, a place where you go to be protected from rain or from a storm. And then the psalm says something interesting, a very present help in trouble. Now, the word trouble in Hebrew was a word that meant uh, pressed in in a tight space under pressure, like we would say between a rock and a hard place. That's what the word means. But the phrase very present help is, is interesting. It means a help that's easily found. It means one that is always ready to help. It means a helper who is ever present. Now, this is, this is um, cool to me because we usually think of a place of refuge as a place that we run to. Like when I ran from that bully in, when I was in second grade, I ran all the way home. This place was, I had to get there to be safe. We think of like running to our basement during a tornado warning. Refuge is a place we go to. But the psalm says something a little bit different. It says God is a refuge that is very present. Meaning that he's a place of refuge and safety that, that in a way comes to us, comes to where we are. I'll come back to that in just a minute. And then we move to Psalm, uh, to, to verse 2. Therefore... We will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Psalm is saying, therefore, since we have an ever-present refuge, we will not fear. And then a series of very dramatic and fearsome images. The earth gives way. The mountains fall into the sea. The waters roar and foam. These are not peaceful, relaxing images at all. Uh, The psalm writer is using images of calamity, an earthquake, a storm at sea that comes suddenly without warning and no way to escape. The psalm writer is saying that in times of calamity, 
in times of trouble, we have refuge. Now, what kinds of trouble do we experience? <coughs> Excuse me. Sennacherib isn't outside the walls of the building. What kinds of trouble do we experience? Well, sometimes the earthquake comes in form of, of loss. Uh, the whole world reacted with shock and grief a couple weeks ago at the tragic helicopter crash that took the life of basketball great Kobe Bryant, his daughter, seven other people. It just seems so random and tragic. I've done eight funerals for Chapel Street folks since September. I have another one this coming Wednesday. Sometimes the earthquake comes in the form of, of loss. Or sometimes it comes in the form of sickness and disease. The whole world is concerned about the growing threat of the coronavirus. It started in China. How bad is it? When's it coming here? Who's, it, who's taking care of it? Will it go away? What's happening? We also experience less dramatic, but every bit as traumatic, uh, storms that, like, that are personal, lo- job loss or financial stress, maybe relational brokenness. Trouble comes in all kinds of forms and always brings pain and fear. So where do we go for refuge? Where do we go for help? Where do we go for safety? In our culture, we're, we're pretty much taught to, to run to our resources, our, our financial security, for example. But we all know that all the money in the world can't protect us from disease and death. Or maybe we run to science and technology, maybe medicine. And as, as far as we've advanced, we still don't quite know what to do about the coronavirus. We know all the medicine in the world can't protect us from all disease and all death. Maybe politics and government. Well, uh, no, not so much. Maybe family and friends. That's a great place to go for safety. But sometimes our family is the very thing that's crumbling around us. Where do we go? The psalm says that God's refuge is our strength and that he is ever-present, comes to where we are. Now, if we fast forward to the New Testament, we are told that Jesus came into this world as Emmanuel, the God who is with us. We talk about that at Christmas time. But he's with us today, the New Testament says, in the person of the Holy Spirit by faith. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 in the New Testament. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, listen, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I think Paul's talking about the same refuge that the psalm writer's talking about hundreds of years before. He's talking about a peace a refuge, a safety that transcends all understanding. It's a refuge that doesn't make any sense based on what's going on around us, yet it comes to us in times of trouble. It's a peace we can know because God is our refuge and is ever-present with us. That's the first thing we see in the psalm. God is our refuge. The second thing is God is our river. Now, this is a little bit of a different analogy, so let me try to take you through it. Last summer... I had a chance to spend 17 days in the Middle East and in Africa visiting some of our Serve the World partners as a church. Uh, in Tanzania, I was there for maybe six days and was with a group that was overseeing the planting of hundreds of churches in, in remote villages in Tanzania, like this one that's about uh, two hours outside of Dar es Salaam. You can just see by that typical home what these villages look like. Um, the organization's called the Timothy Initiative, and they train pastors who train other pastors, they go into these remote villages, they begin to preach, and and, and sooner or later, a church is formed. This is one of the churches we uh, celebrated its opening. This is a a bunch of of Christians, new Christians, and you can see just barely part of their church building, they're building in the back there, just made out of of sticks that are tied together uh, with rope. But we learned there that one of the issues uh, most of these villages are facing is the lack of clean water. Something we take completely for granted where we live. It was common to hear stories of women who are walking one hour each way every morning to, pick, to, to find water for their families, and often that water wasn't even clean. That's why one of our Chapel Street ministry partners is called Life Water International that are putting wells in these remote villages all over Africa, and we support uh, this ministry uh, uh, quite, quite a bit. Now, throughout human history, and even in many places in the world today, The presence of clean water means life. The absence of clean water means disease 
and death. And that's part of the reason why I think the psalm writer uses this image here. Verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. Now, the image of a river runs all throughout the Bible. Let me take you on a quick tour. The Bible begins in Genesis with a description of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And right in the center of the garden is a great river. Verse, two, uh, verse 10 of chapter 2 says, A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. So one great river dividing into four rivers. And they are named in the book of Genesis, and two of them are still flowing today, the Tigris and the Euphrates. If we go jump all the way to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, we read something similar about the new heaven and new earth. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Those are symbolic images of heaven itself. And in between Genesis and Revelation, water, rivers describe spiritual life and growth. Psalm 1, the psalm with, with, with which we began this series, starts like this. Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields in its fruit season, whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Jesus himself used the image of water to speak about eternal life. In John chapter 4, he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give then will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So water or a river is symbolic of the presence and provision of God. It points to the salvation and the eternal life that God gives. So the psalm writer says this river runs through what he calls the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. And this points to three places where God is said to dwell. First, the ancient city of Jerusalem, uh, the place of God's dwelling in the tabernacle, later in the great temple. But what's interesting is the city of Jerusalem then and now does not have a river running through it, not a literal river. There's a spring outside the city that Hezekiah made the tunnel to draw water into the city to help the people survive the siege, and that may be on the psalm writer's mind, but it's not a literal, literal river. This is a spiritual symbol. It's a symbol of the presence of God with his people to sustain and provide. The city of God also refers to us right here today, all these centuries later, because the church is the place where God dwells through his spirit. And finally, the city of God points to the future dwelling place God is even now preparing for his people. That is the new heaven and new earth. So the river of water is the symbol of eternal life. So when the psalm says there's a river that makes glad the city of God, he's talking about the refuge, place of safety, but more than that, a place where there is an, a never-ending stream of God's grace that provides for us, that sustains us, that promises us life and hope. And then in verse 5, the psalm begins to shift. It says, God is in the midst of her. That's the river. That's his presence. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And then the second, Selah. Here the psalm begins to transition a bit. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. Saying the whole world is in chaos and turmoil. Interesting to me, when I read these ancient words, how contemporary they are. That was true 2,500 years ago, and it's still true today. The nations rage and kingdoms totter. And then we see verse 7, a verse that's going to re be repeated again, word for word, at the end of the psalm. And this is sort of a refrain, and this is the center of this psalm. Verse 7 says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I want you to notice the subtle change in language here. From, from God, that's the Hebrew word Elohim, sort of the generic word for a divine being, and it moves to the Lord of hosts. Lord there is a translation of the word Yahweh. That's the personal name of God. So no longer just God, the divine being over all things, but Yahweh, the God who gave us his name, the Lord of hosts is with us. Now, the Lord of hosts is a kind of title, refers to the Lord of battle. 
the heavenly Lord of the armies of God, terrifying and coming to destroy his enemies. That's what the title means, Lord of hosts. So the psalm moves from God is our refuge to the God of Jacob is our fortress. No longer he's using the language of comfort and care. He's now using the language of battle and warfare. God is not only our place of safety and refuge. God is our defender. He's the one who fights on our behalf. And this leads us to the third section of this psalm that I'm calling God is our rest our rest. Verse 8, come behold the works of the Lord. Come see what the Lord of hosts, what Yahweh has done. How he has brought desolations on the earth. The word desolations means ruin, waste, horrors. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Now what's this sound like? Again, this is not peaceful imagery. He's brought desolations. This points to judgment against the wicked, the judgment of God against all evil, the judgment of God against his spiritual enemies. He makes wars cease. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. He's telling us he fights for his people. He promises ultimate victory. And he brings peace. Now this psalm is looking back, most likely to the siege of Jerusalem, looking back to what Yahweh has already done. Remember that time when the Assyrians marched in our city? Remember that time when, when Sennacherib was threatening to kill all our people and taking us all into captivity? Remember that time? Remember how hopeless it felt? Remember how scared we were? Remember what God did? How the whole army was laid waste. How he retreated. And it's looking forward to the future, what God will do. The final defeat of sin and death through the death and resurrection of Christ himself that we know about in the New Testament. The promised return of Jesus as the conquering king who will rule the new heaven and the new earth. And now we come to the verse that everybody's heard. Now we come to the familiar verse. Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Now as I mentioned, uh, this is the part of this psalm that most everyone has heard. And it sounds a lot like Uh, the spiritual center of the psalm. But I say that because the more I look at this psalm, this verse isn't really the center. It's the result of the center of the psalm. Let me try to explain. Now, what does it mean to be still? We we hear that phrase. We think of, uh, like my mom, when we were kids in church, we're squirming in the pew. She says, shh, shh, be still. Or driving on a vacation somewhere, we're in the back seat doing, you know, as brothers tussling and my dad be still. Uh, don't make me come back there. Right? Be still. We think of it as meaning to, to take a break from our busyness, to stop hurrying around, to maybe sit on our porch with a cup of coffee and just ponder the things of God, or taking a walk on the beach and looking at the water. Those things are true. Those things are good. But it's not really the context of this psalm. The psalm is saying the word means to, to relax, to sort of drop your hands. It means to cease or to stop fighting. Stop your fighting. Now, I want you to see there's a double message here. God here is speaking both to his enemies and to his people. He's saying, because if you think about what came before, he breaks the bow and shatters the spear, he burns the chariots with fire, and what comes right after, I will be exalted in the earth. He has two messages. To his enemies, to those who, who would fight against him, he says, you need to know who you're dealing with. You need to know who I am. You need to know who you're fighting against. You're up against the Lord of hosts. My name is Yahweh. I have all the authority. I have all the power. I'm going to judge good and evil. And victory is ultimately mine. You need to know who you're against. To his people, to us, he's saying, remember who I am. Remember what I have done. And remember what I promised to do. Psalm is saying, he is your refuge. He's your river. He is the Lord of hosts who fights for you. So be still. Stop your fighting. I think the psalmist is teaching us that we can be still because he fights battles that we no longer have to fight. Now, what battles are those? The Lord of hosts has defeated the enemy of sin 
by nailing our sins to the cross through Jesus. The Lord of hosts has defeated the, the enemy called shame. You know that little voice that tells you, well, you're not really good enough. You know, your past sins and your mistakes have, have rendered you disqualified from God's love and God's grace. You aren't good enough. That's not the voice of God. That's the voice of the spiritual enemy. God, the Lord of hosts says, no, 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 no. I paid for you. I chose you. I adopted you. You're mine. Shame is not part of the equation anymore. The Lord of hosts has defeated the enemy called fear. He says, there's nothing that can happen to you in your life. There's nothing that can happen to you that I do not allow. There's nothing that can happen to you that I cannot transform into your good and into my glory. And the Lord of hosts has defeated the enemy we call death. What the Bible calls the final enemy. Defeated by his promise of life. Life everlasting. So we can be still, we can stop fighting because the Lord of hosts fights for us. And then the psalm ends with that refrain again. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And then the psalm writer in his own voice says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah, think about that. I want to end by going back to... uh, my little second grade self, I um, expect more sympathy this time, but standing on, the, <laughs> standing on the sidewalk in front of my school, confronted by the evil fifth grade bully. But imagine if instead of me standing there alone, confronted by the bully, that, you know, uh, my friend Clint Eastwood showed up. <laughs> How cool would that be, right? Go ahead, make my day, right? Or maybe, maybe The Rock. You know, maybe Dwayne Johnson, that'd be cool too. Maybe, or maybe just my dad. But if someone came there, I would not have been alone, right? I wouldn't have had to be there vulnerable and afraid. I would have had someone, I would have had refuge. I would have had someone fighting for me. And the psalm says that when the earthquake comes, when the storm comes, and they will, when the enemy attacks, and he will, we have a refuge. We have a God who is our refuge and who comes to us so. So what is your earthquake today? What storm do you face? Where do you feel fearful and alone in your life? The God who is our refuge, the psalm writer says, comes to us. He comes to us. He brings his peace, a peace that makes no sense, a peace that we should not feel. But he brings it to us. And there's a river of God's presence and God's grace and God's provision. A river that never runs dry. A river that flows endlessly and that makes glad. And finally, there's rest. Rest in the promise of an ultimate and final victory because the Lord of hosts fights for you. Therefore, the psalm says, therefore, be still and know that he is God. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord, I thank you for this ancient song, a song that reminds us who you are. And I can only guess that there are some here today who feel like their world is crumbling in some way, maybe crumbling around them, maybe crumbling within them. We're living through a storm that no one knows about, but you do. Remind them that they have a place of refuge, that you come to them by your spirit. Strengthen them by the never-ending river of your grace and provision and love. Remind them that you fight for them and that they can be still in the confidence that victory is yours. It's in your name that I pray.